year. Uh, we thought that uh, this would be a good time to just for the new people to be exposed to the new forms and those veterans uh, just kind of be uh, brushed off on the forms. There are some new forms uh, that you will see, uh, and we have done some changes um, to the old forms and the reporting periods. Um, the first thing is we do have some logistics for the webinar. It will last approximately one hour. And you can ask a question, as we allow all the time in our webinars, either by raising your hand, and John will show you that. Yeah, it's just right underneath your name. Uh, if you click the raise the hand, and I'll see it, and I'll unmute your line. Okay. Or you can also go to the Q&A function and ask your question. Um, John will try to respond to that uh, as you ask it. Uh, some of them we may hold till the end uh, so that uh, other people who have more experience can give you the correct answer. All phones of the attendees are muted, so we, can, uh, we don't get a lot of X outside noise. Um, and also, this re webinar is being recorded, and we will have it posted at the website and we have the website there. Uh, if you have not visited that website, you really need to probably have that on your desktop because we are using our website extensive, extensively. The CDBG program page uh, is up and has a lot of re resources for you on there. Uh, we will be doing the same with all of the other programs. We'll also be having an environmental review page, a labor standards page. Unfortunately, it just takes time, and you know we try to do it as we can. So please uh, make sure that you visit that site. We will also be having the templates of all the forms that you see today uh, will be on that site starting next week. Uh, so you should have all the information you need to be able to submit these forms on time and uh, in compliance. Okay, first thing we want to discuss is the reporting schedule. And I know at the annual conference in uh, April, we passed out a reporting schedule, um, and there has been changes to that, as you can see. Um, some, of, some of the major changes on here is that all of the annual reports are now due at the same time, so you're returning them in at the same time, except for the MBE WBE. That one is, is due in October. Everything else is due the third Monday in January every year. And so for 2014, your reports are due by January 20th, of that year, of 2014. You also notice on there that we give you specific people, if you have any questions, who the questions should be directed to, but now the forms will be sent in to our mailboxes. We now have designated mailboxes for our programs and also for some of the larger um, forms that come in. These will go into the mailbox and we will draw them down. Uh, you can submit these forms uh, electronically and we will pick them up out of the mailbox to make sure that we enter them into the tracking system. If you go back to the form number, you will notice that some of them have TBD at the end of them and that is to be, what it means is to be determined, and that is because these forms are still in, in process. We have to get them branded. For this year, you will be getting draft forms, uh, but after that, all of our forms will be branded and uh, cannot be changed. So uh, the reporting schedule in the future, you'll see the actual form numbers on there once they're assigned. Okay, we are going to go now to the actual forms. 
the way this uh, webinar will run is that the respective person who um, you ask the questions with will be presenting the forms. Uh, we give you sa sample form online so uh, you can look at it and you can ask any questions off the forms. We will allow you to ask questions after each form is presented. So the first form that we're going to uh, present is the Section 3 Summary Report Form. And as I said before, that is due January 20th, 2014. And the person that will be presenting that is Chris Howell, who is our compliance officer. And um, she is also, besides environmental review, she is in charge of all of our labor st standards compliance. And she will present the Section 3 form. Good morning. Um, the first one we're looking at is the Section 3 report, which is the 60002 form. Um, we have a sample for you that we filled out, you know, showing you kind of what we expect to see when you submit these reports. Um, so in the first part for number two, where it has the federal ID number, we ask that you put your contract number, which is appears on your blueback contract that you receive from DCD. Um, the amount where it has the dollar amount of the award is what your contract award was for the year that you're reporting. Um, the contact person is the one who's responsible for filling the form out if we have any questions, as well as the phone number. Reporting period is the date, of course, you know, the year that this information is coming in for. Um, program name is the funding source, which I guess the funding source you can find at the bottom of the page. No, John, is that for? I'm sorry. The, fun, the funding name would be the name of the grantee as well as we ask that you put the funding source in there as well. And then we filled out the categories for you. Um, just Again, just giving you an example of what we expect to see if you have um, positions in these categories. On page two, the first one is um, construction contracts would be the amount of money that you spent during this report period. Um, then you just go through the different categories, you know, total dollar amount and so forth. When you get to number two for non-construction contracts, again, um, you would put a dollar amount in there for engineering services, admin, so forth. At the bottom of the form, a lot of you, when you're filling this out, you forget to fill this section out. It, it wants to know what kind of um, procedures you're taking to get Section 3 businesses, like what kind of recruiting efforts you're taking. So when you submit this report, we ask that you please fill this section out and indicate what kind of um, measures you're taking to seek Section 3 businesses. The next report is the Labor Standards Report, which is the 4710 um, agency name. Again, this was filled out um, as a sample for, for you. Agency name, of course, will be you, the grantee. Agency type is the um, funding source that you're using. Reporting period, again, is the period in which you report. Chris, and one of the things here, too, uh, this report is not an annual report. It's actually mm -hmm. a biannual report. So those due dates are in April and October. When you look at number one on the screen, it's showing you a dollar amount. It shouldn't be a dollar amount. It should be the number of contracts that you awarded during this period. So for the sample that we have on here, it would be one. Total dollar amount for the prime contracts, again, would be what you are reporting in this report. Um, under the project name, where it has example, we have a contract number with the year. So when you submit this report, we ask that you put the contract number. Again, that's the number that appears on your blue back contract between DCD and yourself, as well as the year of the contract and um, the name of the activity that you're undertaking. Contract amount, again, will be what you spent for that project. Wage decision number, all the information that you see there is to appear on the report when you submit it because, like I said, again, this info all goes to HUD and all of this information is needed, as well as a, uh, a bid date. And then also don't forget when you're submitting the report that you 
do the second page. A lot of times we'll just get the first page and the second page doesn't come along with it. Um, next up we have the, um, go ahead. Um, one thing we want to state here is that even if you do not have a contract during that period of time, you still need to submit the reports and write on it no activity during this time. Uh, as we have stated before at the annual conference and at numerous webinars, we are now tracking the submission of these reports and we are also reviewing this, the, them for whether you're drawing money down. Uh, I believe some, some people have already, uh, John has already called some people uh, about the fact that they did not submit a labor standards report, but yet they showed that money was drawn down on a contract. So we are now uh, looking at these forms, uh, verifying that if you have not sent the form in, that you have not spent any money in that activity. If you um, are actually doing the project and you don't send the form in, you are now out of compliance and they, we are looking at doing enforcement. So I do have to emphasize the fact that these reports still need to be submitted in the time it says, even if you do not have any work during that period. Are there any questions on either one of these forms? Okay, the question is, for the labor standards report, how do you want multi-year projects reflected where funds for the contract <laughs> are coming from multi-contract years? What you would do is you, under the example that we showed you, whatever activity has taken place during this report period, you'll put the contract number as well as the year with the uh, description of what activity you undertook. I hope that answers the question. Okay, how do I know which program code applies? What funding source are you using? Is it CDBG, HOME? You just put what source you're using. Okay. If you use more than one funding source for a contract, do you list the, the contract amount of CDBG dollars or the entire contract that was awarded. If you're doing different funding sources, you're doing two different reports. CDBG is done on one report, HOME's done on another report. But if you're using two different years, it doesn't matter, right? Correct, yeah. Right, so if you're using 2010 and 2011, that does not matter. It's still just CDBG. I also want to remind everybody that Section 3 reports are coming due um, according to the schedule. They'll be due here to DCD on uh, January 20th. We'll be re sending a reminder out then also. Yeah, they'll, we'll be sending, after the uh, webinar, we'll be sending a CD and H alert out, uh, which will have all of the forms attached as well as the information on being able to get to the webinar, and that will be your reminder. Okay. okay. We, have, we, have, we have a couple audio questions. Oh, okay. Um, Sarah, Sarah Andrews, I'm going to unmute your line and just uh, go ahead and answer, ask your question. Sarah, uh, my question on? is on the Section 3 form where you have to identify the employment information, employment and training. I just want to be sure, is that for just those jobs that are covered under the, the CDG program or is it for the entire municipality? CBG program. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. And we have Robin. Robin, um, go ahead. Your lines on mute. Hi, go ahead, Robin. Um, I with the labor standards report. I thought, and maybe I've known this in the past and reported correctly, but if a job is not complete, I didn't think you reported on it unless it was complete. Is that incorrect? It's whatever funds were spent during this report period. Okay, okay. So I may have contract, known that. 
Yeah, if the contract exp uh, extends two years, you would be reporting on that same job for two different years just for the oh, amount okay. that was spent in that year. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. And we have one more question on the uh, okay. section uh, um, form. Exa uh, your ex example form 60002, you use program code 8. What is that? It's just what program. On the bottom of the form, on, on the section 3 summary report is what the question asks on. Um, the program code eight is the yeah it will be this example was for the CBG um, um, program um, it just I think this might have been an older form we used an example on um, the new form would just include the program code name in general just in just state the CDBG program. Yeah, so that so that number won't be there. You'll just be putting in the program, whether it's CDBG or home. And for people who ask their questions verbally, if we got to you, can you uh, just lower your hand? Just click the same button to lower your hand, so we know not to um, get your name asked again. Sarah, do you have another question? No, I no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. And we have one more question here before we move on. Just to be clear, we report contracts that we have entered into in the time period in the labor standards report, not when we spend the money, right? I thought we were looking for funds. We're looking for the money that was spent during that time period. Right. So you total dollar amount, total word of contract amount. Award of the contract or the amount that was spent that year? Or yes, the amount that was spent that year. Right. So, like I said before, if you have a project that goes over two years, you will probably you will enter that contract twice. So, say you started it in October of 2013, and it's not going to be over until May 1st of 2014. You will report on that contract twice. The first time will be for the amount expended in 2013 on that contract. The second would be the amount expended on 2014 on that contract. Now, if you don't have any drawdowns in 13, you just awarded the bid, you would wait to 2014 to when you actually expend the funds. Okay, we'll move on now uh, to the MBE WBE activity report. And uh, the person who is in charge of this is John Cherry. He is our ED analyst. Uh, he's also our webmaster. You, you heard me referring to John, that's who it is. Uh, and he also assists Chris with the environmental review. Go ahead, John. Um, this report, the MBE WBE contract subcontract activity report, is due on the first Wednesday in October of each year. This is a yearly report. Um, basically, what we just need for you is to just, you know, complete the top part in its full entirety, you know, the grantee name, location where you're at, contact person in charge of the report, um, and the date that you submitted to the field office to us here at DCED. And then just down below, we just provide a couple of examples. We are asking for a contract number for this activity as well. Like um, it can be found in the blue packet with your uh, program grant, and the contract and the, the year of the uh, the contract, the dollar amount of the contract or subcontract, um, the type of uh, trade code. It can be found at the bottom of the first page of the report, as well as the. Um, um, part 7D is, can be found as well, the ethnicity of the uh, uh, individual of the business. Um, we are asking that you do complete, is it women-owned business or Section 3-owned business? It's either a yes or no question, that 7E and 7G as well. And please, if it is yes on either or, 
um, indicate the contractor identification number, whether it be um, in, um, the federal ID number or social security number as well. Then after you complete all that, please indicate um, the contractor name and address as well. Okay, and this is the one report, that even though it's an annual report, it is um, due in October. So it will cover the October 1st to September 30th time period. Um, as you can tell, this is a HUD report. We can't change that, and that is the HUD federal year. So this is the one report that's a little different when you're reporting annually. Any questions for John or on that report? Okay, at the start of the session, I think MJ stated all the reporting requirements are due January 20, 2014. It should be 14. Yet some of the reports are due other times. Yeah, I, I stated that all of the annual reports, other than the MBEWB, are due at the same time. That's January 20th, 2014. If you look on your reporting schedule, the semi-annual report, which is the labor standards report, that is done twice a year and it has its own due dates. The only annual report that's different is the MBEWB. Everything else comes in at the same time. Okay, any other questions? Okay. If not, we're going to move on to the new report. These three that we just presented, you actually have been doing all along. And I do want to also state that even the MBE, even if you don't have MBE or WBE, again, you need to submit the report and just write on it that you had no activity. Uh, we will be checking those reports and you will uh, be getting calls from John uh, if you do not submit them. Okay, these new reports are um, areas of compliance that you have been supposedly uh, adhering to, but we really haven't given uh, you a report on it, and we're finding as we go out in, and monitor these uh, programs that um, these areas may not necessarily be, be in compliance with. So your new reports consist of the Fair Housing Action Report, uh, which takes the place of the survey that was done a couple years ago, uh, and this will become an annual report, again, due the third Monday in January. There's the Interest Repayment Report. Uh, we mentioned this at the annual conference in April, and um, it, you'll see that it has changed a little bit, plus we have some good news about the interest repayment. The fiscal status report, this is not a new report, but it is new that it has to be submitted annually. The fiscal status report before was only submitted when you closed out the project. We now want to see it annually, um, and we'll discuss that more. And then the SHPO No Effect Activities Report. Again, this is a report that's been out there for years. Uh, we just have not enforced the fact that you are to be submitting it on an annual basis, and we'll discuss that further. Um, and the, uh, for the SHPO there, you see that it's all programs doing housing and public facility activities that don't require SHPO review. So if you um, have activities that are already being submitted for SHPO review, uh, you still would need to do the report, but then you could just say on there that no activities um, fall under that category. Okay, the first report we'll go over, the new report, is the Fair Housing Action Report. Again, this is due January 20th, 2014. And um, Megan Snyder, our newbie here, uh, will be presenting a portion of this report. Uh, she is an analyst as well, and she will be doing your fair housing compliance 
as well as assisting Tina and Crystal with IDIS uh, projects. So Megan, go ahead. Okay. Um, two years ago, um, you folks had this training. Uh, if you're newer, you probably didn't have the training. It was also mentioned at the uh, annual conference. Uh, the report was made up in Excel. It is easy to navigate. You just use your tab button and then type in this um, spot given. Uh, if you try and type in another spot, it probably won't let you because we have blocked the cells that you want to type in. Um, uh, when we ask that you use this form, please don't create your own form, and um, you can email that to me once you have it completed. Again, it is due on January 20th. Um, we'll start at the top of the form um, and go down through. Uh, the grantee, of course, is the agency name. The date prepared is the current date that you're preparing it. The contact person is the person filling out the form, along with their email address and phone number. Uh, the reporting year. Um, we're asking this year when you send it in that you complete a 2012 and a 2013. Um, two and, separate reports. Yeah, two separate reports. And the reporting period is January 1st through December 31st uh, for both 2012 and 2013. One will be for the year of January 1st, 2012 to December 31st of 2012, and your 13 report would be for January 1st, 2013 to December 31st, 2013. Okay, and then if you look at the mandatory activities, number one, the date of the fair housing advertisement, this is to be done annually, so we want you to put a date in there. Number two, the fair housing officer name and contact information, email address, phone number, office that they're located in. And then number three is the um, any complaints that the fair housing officer received, we would like you to indicate uh, an X in the box yes or no, and then explain below in the box given um, the number and the type. Um, also question three, four, and five, we gave you a box. If you run out of space in that box, um, or when you go to print it, you can't see everything that you typed, we ask that you um, type it in a Word document and also attach that. And then I'm going to turn it back over to MJ for question four and five. Okay. Yes, um, on questions four and five, the, these two questions uh, I, at the annual conference created some um, confusion. Um, some of them were very, some, some grantees had trouble understanding how it would apply to their program, and we wanted to clarify it. Um, as you see, number four, if you're doing a housing component, either with CDBG or all of your home projects, you have to list the dates on, on how you made it, the information available to LMI as well as to all the protected classes under fair housing, that they were aware that the units were available, that the program was being carried out. This is a requirement of the uh, both CDBG and HOME under fair housing, and so we need to know um, how you did that. And the second, and again, it's only if you're doing a housing component. If you're doing public facilities, public service, that's not uh, required. It's only if you're doing a housing component. And the fifth one is uh, number five, question five. If you're doing a home buyer or rental program, we need to know the date of your affirmative marketing plan and, again, how was it distributed to the public. Um, so if you, you have homes for sale or you, have, you built a uh, rental unit or you assisted with the rental unit, and that would include if you bought the ground, if you just acquired the property or you just demoed the building on that property for the housing. You have now tripped your fair housing requirement of having an affirmative marketing plan. And we need to uh, have the date of that plan and how it was distributed. When we go out to monitor is when we will actually look at the plan. So please make sure it's in your files. So um, all of those questions are mandatory for all grantees of CDBG or HOME, and they must be completed every year. Now again, if four and five, if you don't are doing a housing component, all you would say there is not doing a housing component. 
but you do need to fill that out. Going to the second page of the form, this is where your additional activities come in. And if you uh, were at the conference, uh, we've also provided that in a CD and H alert. Besides doing the five mandatory questions, you must also do one additional activity each year, and it must be different each year, that promotes fair housing in your community. So here is where you would identify in detail, and when we say detail, we mean things such as the date, the number of participants, the description of what you did, and any results that may have come by that. So in other words, if you held a training for your real estate people, you would say on October 12, 2013, we held a um, real estate uh, training on the fair housing requirements. Uh, five real estate agents participated. We passed out a pamphlet. I'll uh, give the name of the pamphlet so that, again, we can look that up when we go to monitor. It should be in your files. And the, um, you know, the real estate agents went out with a better idea of um, what they can do and can't do when they're marketing certain properties in your community. Um, so that's the type of detail we are looking for. And if you needed to know what the additional activities are, um, we have a slide there that has a listing. 13, slide 13. Slide 13. Uh, that lists the additional activities. Now, I do have to stress here, and you see right after at the top, this is just a sample list. Um, you know, it was just to give you some ideas on different things that you might want to do. You certainly don't need to follow that list. Uh, you can come up with activities yourself as far as, as long as they deal with fair housing. Uh, if you have a question as to whether they, that would comply or not, you know, contact Megan and she will be able to investigate it for you and, and let you know if that's an activity. Um, you know, anything dealing with fair housing, now you attending a fair housing training, no, that, that's not an activity, but you putting on a training or, um, you know, or doing a, a pamphlet biz or, um, you know, doing uh, sign posters or something like that, yes, that can be an activity that is used. So, again, I want to stress that each year it must be a different activity and you need to report on it with, with your reports. The final part of the report is a certification of your chief elected official. So again, you, you've seen this on many of our reports and, and uh, other uh, forms that we have you send in. You need to have this form signed by your chief elected official. It does not have to be at a public meeting, but we do need to have their, their signature that they're aware that these activities have occurred. Okay, um, we can open it up for any questions. Okay, I see uh, Faith. Faith has a question. Uh, Faith, I'm going to mute your line and go ahead. Faith? Okay, um, my question is, it, it asks for the, to, I'm sorry? You bring it, 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 asks, it asks to identify the person qualified to serve, or the, the person that, that is doing the fair housing officer. What if they haven't, uh, designated a fair housing officer. If uh, you should be having that it's your, it's, if you don't have a fair housing officer, that it would be the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Um, if you looked in the fair housing brochure or pamphlet uh, booklet that is on the website, it shows you if you do not have a fair housing officer designate in your area, how you go about doing that. Uh, but you should be putting that information in your advertisement when you do it each year. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Robin, I believe you have another question. Um, I'm going to meet your line and go ahead. 
you have a question, Okay. Yes, I do. Thank you. I have actually three on this one. Um, the, when we always put the fair housing notice in at the time of an application, and that is different than what you're saying. Um, I'm trying to read my sloppy handwriting. Um, f from what I understand, or think I understand, if you're doing a project that you, to notify low to moderate income or the elderly, that 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 notice would be more project specific. Is that correct? That's correct. The the advertisement that you do for your application would be the date on number one. That would be your advertisement oh. that, you know, your your municipality is following the fair housing rules right. and guidelines. If you're doing a housing program that requires you either in four or five, um, you, you can run another advertisement like once the units are built or once the, the rental, you know, there's available uh, rental uh, units then you are going to run another advertisement in the paper, or you may do a pamphlet in the local churches or whatever. That's the type of thing that you need to answer then in number four and five. And five okay. should be an actual marketing plan so that people are aware in those protected classes that they can apply for those units. Okay, we don't do any rentals here, but uh, for the housing, so – I I get a a standard if not more um amount from each C D B G year for housing rehab. Uh so what would I put an ad in each year, like when that money is released? Well, what you would do is and you would be only answering for housing rehab, you would only be answering number four because right. that's a housing component. Uh right. you don't have to run an ad. You know, if you if you're only doing housing rehab in one small community, uh, putting a poster up in the post office and at the grocery store that you know this is available, um, putting a pamphlet in the food bank, uh, you know, people going to the food okay. uh, bank, that type of thing. You don't always have to run advertisements. We're not trying to say you know that, that you're spending all your money on these expensive advertisements. Right. You need to determine what is the best way to notify the individuals in that area that this activity is available. Okay, and then to to post or pamphlets or whatever, I have a waiting list. So I would put these out and get add more people to my waiting list. That that is true. Uh, okay. You know, if you if you have not uh, made it aware in that community that these activities are available, then yes, you would have to make them uh, aware of that. Okay, and then let's see one more. Who? Oh, if say I did a, a presentation or a meeting and wanted to give people information on fair housing, I certainly don't feel informed enough to to conduct that it could i find someone who would do that at the pa human relations yes and yes, then you there would be a a cost associated with that though there correct? may be and and you can take that from your admin costs right my admin doesn't cover my salary at this time so that's a problem right well you can you can you know couple with other counties uh, as uh -huh. long as you make sure the people in your county are informed that it's going to happen. Uh, right. This was a question that, that came up before, you know, especially on a borough or a township. Can they piggyback on what the county is doing? And the answer to that is yes, they can, as long as they make the effort to inform the people in the borough. So if it is a real estate uh, say the county's putting on a real estate training for, for real estate people, and the borough wants to, to piggyback on that as their activity, then the borough has to take the effort of getting their real estate people, and, and not necessarily just the real estate people in that borough, but anybody who serves that borough. So, you know, 
they need to make the effort to get their people to that training to uh, to be able to be counted on. You can't just say, oh yes, um, Tioga County ran this pro uh, this program and they covered us. Uh -huh. We want to see what, as the borough, you did to make sure your borough people were informed. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. A question here in the in the uh, room was, can you post this information on your website? And the answer to that would be yes. The only problem is you've got to remember the, the protected classes you are addressing. Uh, you're talking low income, elderly. Are they really going to be aware of a website? So for that to be a standalone activity, I would say no. Now, if you if you pass if you put it on your website and then you pass out a pamphlet that said go here, there's more information. Then yes. Okay. Uh, are additional activities a requirement if we primarily do public facility projects? Yes. The additional activities are for any grant whether it's CDBG or home, it does not matter if it's housing or not. You still need, because you're a federally funded activity, you're receiving federal funds, you have to still do something to promote fair housing in your community, even if you're not doing housing related activities. Is the fair housing action activity to be reported for 2012 also? Yes. As Megan said, you should be sub submitting two reports. One will be for the reporting period of January 1st, 2012 to December 31st of 2012. The second will be your 2013 report, which will report activities for from January 1st of 2013 to December of 2013. If you remember, we sent out a CD&H alert around the end of 2012 that reminded you that you needed to do these activities. So you should have done one in 2012. We also mentioned it at the annual conference both years that you needed to do this annually. So your activity for 2012 needed to take place in 2012 and it cannot be the same activity you did in 2013. Uh, can you partner with another CDBG recipient or agency to do the additional activity? I did mention that, that yes, you can, as long as you're making sure your residents are getting that information, you're taking whatever uh, actions you need to take to make sure that they are getting the training. If we are only doing home rehabilitation in the home program and only street reconstruction in CDBG, do we still need to do the fair action report? Yes. It is every person, every grantee receiving federal funds needs to do the report. If not, they'll get a call from me. Yes, if not, Megan just said you will get a call from her. John won't be calling on these, Megan will be. <laughs> Regarding fair housing, do we need to do the report if we are not doing any housing projects? For the past several years, my county has been working on sewer and water lines and sidewalks. Yes. Even though you are only doing public facility projects, you are still, read your statement of insurances. You are assuring that you are going to promote fair housing in your town or your borough or your county. This is the compliance report that assures us that you are. So even if you're not doing housing, you still need to put this report in and be doing the activities. The only places you will not have an answer will be questions four and five. This is also to help us report back to HUD, correct? Oh, yes. Yes. All, the information we gather from this goes into our CAPER, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, so that this is why we're wanting it in writing so that we have it to be able to report on. What is the sanction against the community if you did not do a fair housing activity in 2012? 
we have not decided on exactly what that may be uh, because this is, is new, uh, though we have done quite a bit of training. Uh, you know, at this point, it may be a finding, and we may um, have you have to do some sort of scheduled trainings uh, or, you know, watch you in the future that you are doing this. Um, so, you know, right now, since nothing was done in 12, you still should have been able to advertise and done the first five sections, five questions. That's right. I have to reiterate the fact that your county commissioner is, 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 is signing off on the assurance in the statement of assurances that you are doing these activities and you are um, promoting it in your community. So I can't stress enough that you need to do this. <coughs> And I'm not saying that there won't be any penalties in the future. Okay, and our final question, Diana, you have a voice question. I'm going to mute your line. Go ahead, Diana. Okay. Um, yes, hi. I have actually two questions for you. Um, for, for four. When you talk about doing a housing component with CDBG, um, we specifically don't do housing in the city. However, I have done um, a project with a nonprofit where we cleared a site, and I, I think I heard you say that, where we cleared the site and they put affordable housing on, those, on, those, um, on that site. Now, my question is, they have done um, their publication, um, notifying, gathering um, um, individuals for their rental units and for the houses. Um, do I need to gather their information um, that they've submitted to provide um, information to LMI and elderly and, and the disabled populations, or should I have done that on my own? No, you can, you can couple with the, uh, the housing authority or the nonprofit that, you know, they're the ones that are actually going to market those units. So they should have an affirmative marketing plan in place. Um, but you, as the grantee that provided them the ground, should make sure that they are aware that they do need to have that in place. It, this is just like the environmental reviews. You know, it, it's for the entire project. So just because you're de demo, demoing, demolishing something does not say, okay, now I don't have to follow through with whatever's going on to that property. It becomes the entire project. But yes, you can you can work with whoever is actually going to administer that program, manage the, the housing units, and get their affirmative marketing plan. Okay. My second question is on five, when it says when you're doing a home buyer. Now we we don't have a rental program, but we have a first time home buyer program. Now I work with realtors on this program. I don't necessarily go to their monthly meetings, but I talk with them um, you know, practically, you know, every other week um, because they're calling about the program, they want information, we discuss it. Um, should I be meeting with the, um, with the Real Estate Association too and trying to, um, you know, inform them of our marketing plan and the fair housing analysis? I mean, I don't know exactly. I haven't done that recently. Um, I usually, you know, it's based on income when the individuals come. To purchase a home, they have to meet, you know, LMI. They have to be a first-time home buyer. Um, I'm not marketing; it's not my house. But what exactly should I be doing with the real estate agencies? Well, definitely, you should be, you know, if if you have a home buyer program, you should definitely start a a fair housing training uh, or provide a fair housing training for the, them. Because, you know, even though they, people are coming in, you know, first thing, they're low income. Uh, you know, sometimes they, they, the real estate person will direct that person to a certain neighborhood because that's where all the low income people live. Uh, that is definitely in violation of fair housing. Uh, you know, so your, your real estate people need to be made aware of what exactly is fair housing and, and you know, them directing people, uh, maybe only showing certain houses to them, 
is in violation of fair housing. So, um, yeah, you should conduct some sort of training with them. Uh, even though you're providing just the down payment, again, you are responsible to be in compliance with fair housing. So whatever you need to do to make sure that that's being complied with. Okay, then um, even though I'm talking to them on the phone and I have agents that I have a list of with their names and I discuss fair housing with them and how important it is, you're suggesting that I really should basically go to a, a meeting where I can have um, a group of the realtors and get more of that information out so that they're all aware of it, correct? That's right, yes, because you never know which realtor is going to come in with a house. And it may okay. be sub and, and once they're coming in, it's too late. They've already directed that person to that certain neighborhood or whatever. So they they need to be made aware of the fair and actually your town your your county is not just saying in these programs, it's saying for the county we're not gonna you know we're practicing fair housing, good fair housing uh actions. And so whether or not it's it's something related to your program, they should be not doing anything that's um, discriminatory right. in their regular business. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. We move on. And I apologize. It is probably going to go longer than an hour. We'll try to keep it as, as short as we can. But I think these are all good questions, and we definitely want to um, – be able to answer them now for you so you can fill these reports in accurately. The next new, por uh, new report is the interest earned report. Again, we mentioned this at the annual conference in April. Uh, it is now coming to fruition. Uh, it is due on January 20th of, uh, January of 2014. The good news about this that I kind of teased you with at the beginning is that if you are a grantee that earns less than a hundred thousand, oh, sorry, a hundred dollars or less in interest, you do not need to return that to CD, uh, DCED. You will put it into your administrative fee uh, fund, and you can use it for a CDBG eligible administrative activities. That's the good news. The bad news is every grantee needs to submit this interest earned report, whether or not you earned interest, or even if it's under $100, you still need to return this, the report. Um, and if you have interest over $100, you need to send the check to us, to DCD, uh, you make it out to the Department of Urban uh, Housing and Urban Development. That needs to be sent to us by January 31st of 2014. When, you're re when you are filling out the report, you will be filling out the top of the report with your basic uh, date, grantee name, contract, everything. We ask for the DUNS number to be placed on there. Uh, that's something that you turned in when you turned in your bluebacks. And then the grantee will only be filling out the left side of those columns uh, where it has the contract number and the amount earned. So you can fill out a number of contracts on the same chart uh, and how much out of each year each contract you earned. The right side of it um, of the table, not the top part. You do still need to re fill out the full top part. It's for our use only, and you see where we will be uh, looking for the check and, um, and how much we receive. Again, it is the aggregate, not just the contract year. So if you uh, only received totally last year, or 2013, um, $98.60, you would enter it on the left side, but we are not asking you to resubmit that money. You may keep that money and put it into your admin costs. If you uh, earn $101, then yes, you will be returning that back to the state, or actually to HUD. You make the check out to HUD. 
Any questions? Right. It's not per contract, it's per grantee. The reports that are due in January, I do not have to report because I am new and have not handled any projects. It is the responsibility of the people who prepared the 2000 contract, correct? Uh, no, if you are the grantee, you are responsible for the reports. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, fiscal status report. Um, again, this is due January 20th, 2014. It does look familiar to you, those of you who've been around long enough to close out some projects. Uh, this is the status report that you usually submit only once for a contract. You are now going to be submitting that annually as long as the project is open, and then again you'll submit the final when you go to close out the project. Um, basically the report is, is the same as you do for the closeouts. You fill in the reporting at the top that you're familiar with now, grantee name, all of that. We do ask for your federal ID number. We also ask for your contract number, which is the C number, and is located on your blue uh, contract, your blue back contract from DCD. We also ask that you put in the program. Each one of these fiscal reports will be for each contract and each program. So you might be submitting five CDBG annual fiscal reports this year. This is an effort to get you to close out your programs and get these projects done. Uh, your contract period, you see there it says from and to. That would be on your blue back, whatever the dates are on your blue back. Contract from DCD. And then the reporting period would be January 1st of 2013 to, Jan uh, to December 31st of 2013. So your reporting period is always a year. Your contract period should be about five years for CDBG and home. Uh, the fiscal information there is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you want to put in DCD's approved budget. So if you've had modifications or whatever during 2013, you want to put in there what was the last time your last approved budget. It may not be the same as what's in your blue back. It would be whatever you've modified. How much the cumulative expenses to date? This is not what is in IDIS. You may have more expenses than you've drawn down. So you want to um, have that in there. And then the accrued expenditures would be those that you've actually paid out. And then the balances on your uh, account. The second page, and again, this is uh, pretty much the same as you've had in the past, but notice to the uh, right side there, if you have program income received or expended during this calendar year, it must be receipted in IDIS and be used before any further programs are drawn down. And I want to emphasize this. If you have any program income on hand, you need to contact either uh, Christine Powell, Christina Powell, or Crystal Stauffer on how to receipt this. You will be getting a lot more information on this in the next two to three months uh, on how this is all being done. But from now on, we do need to actually receipt all program income in IDIS as well as the way it's being expended. But if you have any right now, you do need to contact Tina or Crystal, and they will walk you through how to get that into the um, IDIS system. Um, going down, as far as the match goes, there uh, is no required match on CDBG or home unless you are a CHODO. Um, the CHOTOs do have a required match and that needs to be put in there. 
but you also, if you're doing a uh, facility, community facilities program, where you might have PenVest or farmers home money, this is where you identify the money. And again, it would be what was brought in this year for um, that certain activity or program. And in this case, on this form, your chief fiscal officer needs to certify to, to that. Um, that could be the chief fiscal officer of the county or your chief fiscal officer in your office. So if you are a redevelopment authority, uh, it would be your chief fiscal officer in your office versus the, the county treasurer. Um, but we do need to, that they are verifying it uh, to their books that they have on record. Any questions? Could we create my region, create a council on fair, oh, this is back onto the fair housing. That would include the county, entitlement, municipalities, human service groups, housing authority to work on the fair housing requirements. Yes, definitely you could do that, but again, if you are a uh, borough or township, you would have to make sure that you, in those reports, you have it specifically for information for that borough and township. Uh, you can't just fall under the umbrella of the county and say, well, you're covered. You would have to have specific information in there on how the borough of Salem is going to uh, promote fair housing. Would the chief fiscal officer be the finance director, comptroller, or city clerk? Any one of those three. Um, whoever is, would be testifying and keeping those books, uh, you know, whoever is getting that information and would verify that that information is correct. What if you have a revolving loan fund for housing rehab? Do you have to use these funds first before you draw down CDBG and home? Yes. That is what a revolving loan fund is, the same thing with program income. Those funds must be used before you draw down other funds. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, this is the annual no effects activity report. As I said before, this is something that actually should have been turned in by everybody uh, for a long time but we really have not enforced it, and we are now going to start enforcing it. Uh, Pam Riley, as many of you have met Pam over the years, is our SHPO officer and deals with historical preservation, and she'll go over this form with you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully my form isn't too intimidating and there aren't too many changes from uh, how it's been used in the past. Uh, one thing that we have included on there that we never did previously was a contract number, and that is for uh, ease in tracking exactly what program is being covered by this form. That was at the request of the folks at DCED. That, so that contract number appears at the top of the form, and it would be very helpful if you could include that information when you complete it. Uh, we also changed the form just a little bit uh, to include not just housing, no effect housing rehab activities, which was really what it was first designed to do, but to include all activities that are mentioned on the no activities list, meaning these are activities considered to have such a low likelihood that they would impact historic or archaeological resources that it is not necessary for you to submit the entire project documentation to me for review. Instead, you should include them on this list uh, and send it in once a year, showing me that you understand how the no effect activities list works and that you are in compliance. Uh, in the past, we have, um, you know, lots of you have sent the form in. I think there has been no clear direction as to whether or not it's needed to send in a form when you don't really need to send in a form, when you didn't have any activities that I did not review. Uh, that we have made a decision that for um, the purposes of tracking and to demonstrate that everybody's on board, even if you have not undertaken any no-effect activities that did not require review by me, 
you should send the form in and just say, you know, all projects reviewed or, uh, or sent to SHPO or, you know, whatever note you think is appropriate to share the fact that this really doesn't apply to the things you did in the past calendar year, um, and then we'll be good to go. Don't worry about filling in an ER number. That's always my job to assign that. That's a that's a SHPO activity where we keep our own database and tracking system so that we know what information we've received from which communities regarding which projects. And I would then sign the form and mail it back to you. It can be submitted electronically now, so you don't need to create a paper version of the form. And it will be you know, sent in with all of the other um, other forms that you're required to submit at the same time. I hope that makes things uh, a little less cumbersome. And if there are any problems with that or any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact me at any time and I'll do my best to help out. Any questions? I think we want to emphasize the fact that in the past, usually we use this, this list um, was for mostly housing rehab programs. Uh, for individual houses that were uh, less, than 50 years yeah, old. less than 50 years old, had no historical value, things like that. We are now expanding that. It will also include public facility projects um, that maybe did not constitute a historical review uh, because that wasn't found. But this gives us a listing that at least that activity was looked at and you have the documentation in your files that shows that that it was not a historical, had any historical significance. And you know, I should have mentioned, um, we recently reorganized the no effect activities list to make sure that the list I am using corresponded to the same list that others who work at the SHPO office send out to their communities for HUD projects. So the list is essentially the same, but it has been reworked to sort of um, put things together in groupings. There's exterior rehab work, interior rehab work, and then other activities that might include things like curb cuts or um, uh, uh, the uh, relaying of uh, utility pipes where pipes already exist. It's pretty specific, the language that is used there so that you know when you do and do not have a no effect activity. I would be happy to provide a copy of the newly reorganized no effect activity list to any of you via email. It will also be posted on the website uh, so you could easily check it there if you have any questions. Okay, any questions? Okay, nothing. We're almost done. Hold on. I know you're hungry. Uh, okay, submitting the reports. Please pay attention to which mailboxes you need to submit these reports in and also the due date uh, to avoid any capacity issues with these grants. We have to respond to HUD. We have a small, short, we, we're giving you as much time to get these reports done as we possibly can, but we take that information and we have to report to HUD. If we do not do our report to HUD or it's not timely, they can shut this money down. And I have to stress that to you. I, I, a couple times I've heard, well, HUD's coming down on uh, DCD, why are they coming down on us? DCD is only as good as what our grantees are doing, and we have to be able to show HUD that we are in compliance and that we are reporting. So it is imperative that you, you get your reports in on time so we can get our reports in on time. Um, even if there's no activity, or the, uh, with the uh, example for PAMS, um, no effect. We still want the report to come in. All you need to do is put on there no activity, uh, you know, nothing to report, and still submit it because we will be tracking these reports on the tracking system and you will be getting a call if you do not have your report in. Uh, and we will be requiring that report Possibly also uh, there, again, could be some ramifications as far as capacity. Uh, we have the ability to possibly flag you for noncompliance. 
throughout the entire department. And this is not the CDBG flags that you hear from Crystal all the time. This would be no contracting within the department on any of the department's programs. So you certainly don't want to get to that point. Uh, we you know, strongly suggest if you're having any problems to contact the names of the people that are on that reporting schedule so that you can get this completed in time. Okay, now as far as resources go, if there's any questions or you need a copy of the report, the first place you need to go is to the website. This is why we've established the website um, so that you have a one-stop place for forms, templates, the recordings, webinars. Uh, you know, we ask, in fact, a lot of my people are asking you when you ask the questions, did you go there? Uh, because a lot of this information is already there. You can look at it at your own time and be able, then if you have any questions from that, you can go um, then uh, to the next step, which is, this is my compliance staff. These are the contact persons for the specific reports. Uh, you see their names, their uh, emails, and their phone numbers. So we want to give that to you. And the third step then would be contacting your respective grant managers. And again, we gave you a list of their emails, their phone numbers, and the counties that they um, are currently uh, serving. So if you have it, that which the grant manager should be your third step when it comes to these reports. Uh, if you have any questions. And I did have a uh, recommendation from a person here in the, in the room that when you are submitting correspondence to the grant managers and the compliance people, please include the year that, uh, of the program, contract number, some sort of identification so that we can go right to the information we have, whether it's in the tracking system or in the files um, in time, you know, so that we're, we're not wasting time asking you what it is. When you send something, please uh, submit that with your email. All right, any other questions? If not, I thank you very much. We will have this webinar online for you next, month, uh, next week, and we also will have some of the questions on there as well. Thank you, and thank you for your patience.